Yes, uh, thank you for, for having me. It's very unfortunate that I cannot be there in person. Just my, my teaching and family duties made it impossible for me to, to travel now in the middle of the semester. It, it is the first online presentation now, so, so please let me know if you know, there's any difficulties either for the other participants via Zoom or for the people in the room to, to hear or see um, anything of my talk. So I, I looked into the mindfulness literature preparing for this conference, uh, but I have to say um, I have no first-hand experience with meditation or other practices um, related to mindfulness. Um, but, but, I, but I looked into it and uh, I found a lot of like, interesting points of comparison with phenomenological thought, but my talk today will mostly be a, a Heidegger talk. Um, so and it's also like, like now interesting program, it's the third Heidegger talk and having listened to the, the first two, I think there's a lot of agreement, but little overlap, with, which uh, I find nice. I hope you do too. Um, uh, another preliminary, I'm also a supporter of the continuity thesis in Heidegger's thought, as, as you will see um, through uh, my presentation. And I use the term mindfulness not as a translation of, of Besinnung, as it's sometimes in Heidegger translation, but as denoting a general threat um, in Heidegger's thought, or, or I'm using it to refer to the uh, now rather mainstream practices um, in today's um, mindfulness industry. Um, okay, so let's start. Um, so I, I would say that um, in Heidegger, but maybe in phenomenology more generally, um, there is a distinction between three modes of comportment. One could maybe also see like three modes of being in the world um, or, or three attitudes or maybe even three types of knowledges. Um, and to, uh, so, so before I start, there's this distinction that we need to make between uh, in, in German, it's Vollzugsmöglichkeiten and Gehaltsmöglichkeiten. And let me know if you know a good translation of that into English. I, I explain it via an example. So a Gehaltsmöglichkeit, like a content possibility, is like uh, playing the piano in contrast to playing basketball. So those are two Gehaltsmöglichkeiten. And Vollzugsmöglichkeiten, like possibilities of comportment, refer to um, how one goes about that, or how one relates to these practices, playing basketball, playing the violin. And I, I would claim uh, phenomenology distinguishes three of these modes of going about or relating to something. And the first mode is that of distant observation. And that's the mode that's usually associated with classical science. And the type of knowledge is knowing that. So propositional knowledge about something. And like in Husserlian terms, that would be the objective attitude. Um, then second way is skillful absorption. Um, so this is what uh, in today's um, cognitive science is elaborated a lot upon in terms of an action. Um, so how we enact a meaningful world um, and relate to it. The type of knowledge is knowing how, knowing how to open a door, knowing how to throw a ball, knowing how to play an instrument. And like in Husserlian terms, we could say this is what happens um, in the natural attitude. And then there's this third type. Um, and that's what I want to refer to uh, with the term mindfulness. And that basically refers to, in Husserlian terms, the phenomenological attitude. And like terms that Heide uses throughout his work to refer um, to this third mode um, are Entschlossenheit, Besinnung, Gelassenheit. Okay, um, a second important point is um, that we need to understand that classic phenomenology understands phenomenology as ontology. And I think this is something where all classic phenomenologists agree. And I take some quotes from paragraph seven of Being in Time to like give you some textual uh, evidence of that. So Heidegger writes, ontology and phenomenology are not two disciplines which among others belong to philosophy. 
Both terms characterize philosophy itself, its object and procedure. Philosophy is universal phenomenological ontology. And then I cut it because then it describes a specific path of being in time through the hermeneutics of Dasein. But just, I wanna make this point like for Heidegger, phenomenology is ontology and phenomenological ontology is what is philosophy. So philosophy, phenomenology is the way of access to and the demonstrative manner of determining of what is to become the theme of ontology. Ontology is possibly only as phenomenology. And like a third important like quotation uh, that we need to understand in this context is um, that phenomenology has claimed there is nothing behind the phenomena. So there's no difference between being and appearing. But that doesn't mean that everything appears. Rather, um, phenomenologists claim that kind of absence, concealment is inscribed into appearing itself. And that's basically what the third quotation says. Um, so there's some form of imminent transcendence of concealment um, in appearing, but there's nothing behind. And that like, relates again to why phenomenology is ontology. And what is the core finding of phenomenological ontology according to Heidegger? I think if we like really put it into one sentence, it's the groundlessness of mind and world. And I think this is where like the most striking similarity between Heidegger's phenomenological ontology and Buddhist thought is to be found. And I'm mostly like taking my understanding of Buddhism, I haven't done like a source work at all, from, from Varela Roche and Thompson's book, The Embodied Mind. So if somebody has a beef with their rendering, please let me know, because that's where I, I'm taking um, my understanding um, from. Okay, but now I do a bit about being in time and the path of being in time in, in that. And like to start, let, let me say, so, so being in the world, which is the main thing Heidegger wants to analyze in the two divisions of being and time um, that we have available as published um, is a holistic structure. But for the purpose of explication, we can analytically focus on one of the elements of this whole. And that's basically what, what Heidegger does in division one of being and time. He first asks what is the worldliness of the world? And then he asks who is the self of Dasein and then he asks about the relation, but what you need to, so we can start from like the check side and from the subject side, it's the wrong terms, but like to, to render it in like more like common philosophical terminology. Um, but the thing is, no matter where we start, each of these questions only becomes understandable against the background of the whole structure. And no matter where we start, like we should be led to the same holistic structure of being in the world. With that being said, so Heidegger starts out with an analysis of the world and there he contrasts what he in um, quotation marks calls the world, um, which is um, how classical science, according to Heidegger's um, descriptions, understands the world. So as like the sum of objects, um, in three-dimensional space, basically. And he contrasts that with the world of everydayness, um, with Husserl, um, the life world, um, which is constituted by practical engagements. So effective, meaningful sense-making activities. Um, and that's what also is like then analyzed, especially in Malibu Peace work and nowadays in an, an activism. Um, and there again, like we see this, there, there we see this contrast between distant observation, Heidegger calls it a canon, which reveals for Huntenheit um, uh, present at hand and skillful absorption is sorting in Heidegger's terminology, which reveals to Huntenheit availability. Um, but that's not the full story especially if we like read later texts by Heidegger. Um, because what Heidegger 
um, soon after being in time realized is that both being ready to hand and being present at hand are parts of an epistemological technological mode of revealing. So basically, he, does, he, he doesn't think that the distinction between forehand and height and two-hand and height bears much ontological weight. And with that finding, he actually makes a lot of uh, like very important observations. So um, one, one thing I just want to point to is, uh, whereas it's, you know, in, in philosophy of technology is something that has only been like really discovered and become prominent in the last like 30 or 40 years um, that uh, we should speak about techno science. So the science is basically as an application of technology. I mean, Heidegger was saying that from the 30s on. Um, and his entire thought about like technology as a mode of revealing is based on that uh, insight how like these modes he so sharply contrasted with being in time um, relate to like one mode of revealing that we can trace back um, to ancient Greek philosophy. Um, but already in being in time, there is this third mode of comportment, uh, which Heidegger hasn't, doesn't say very much about, but uh, which we can, you know, describe or um, you know, indicate at, as that, that's what the phenomenological attitude is that is carrying the entire analysis of the book. And, and maybe it's Entschlossenheit. We need to um, discuss that. So that was the path coming from the world. The second path is, you know, we can raise a similar issue um, starting with the self and Heidegger's question, who is Dasein? And Heidegger gives a very interesting answer in paragraph 27 of Being in Time. Because what he says there is um, everydayness screams I. So that's you know, the answer that everydayness screams. You know, who, who is Daza? I, I, myself. Uh, but the phenomenological analysis, or Heidegger as the phenomenologist, says I mean, it's nobody. You know, the, the, the self of Daza in everydayness is nobody. And that's interesting because um, that interesting relates to um, then again what uh, mindfulness say. So put a quote here. Um, Just as the mindfulness meditator is amazed to discover how mindless he is in daily life, so is the first insight of the meditator who begins to question the self um, um, are normally not egoless, but the discovery of total egomania. Um, so there's a tension between um, our ongoing sense of self in ordinary experience, like our everyday self screaming I, and to failure to find such a self um, when reflecting on it, either in meditation or in phenomenological analysis. And I think this is of central importance to Buddhism, as the quote says, but I think also to phenomenology. Then there's like a second way of contextualizing that. So, so in the 1920s, Heidegger was writing in the context of like emerging mass society. And so this analysis of anonymity um, also resonated quite well with like, general cultural trends. And uh, like put here on the slides, like a few books by Marcuse and Nathanson that like um, elaborate on this experience of anonymity in mass society. And of course, like starting with this, like analysis of mass society and their anonymity in it, uh, we might say that finding oneself or the self um, could be a trend against the anonymization of mass society. I put a question mark behind that. That's actually the case. Um, but what's interesting, like today, um, I would claim with um, Beckwitz, I think the book hasn't been translated into English yet, but I think English translation should be coming up, that we are living in a society of singularities. So basically what today's culture tells us, we are all self-entrepreneurs. And basically 
the main aim is self-optimization, like tracking oneself, controlling oneself, governing oneself, optimizing oneself. And in that context, we should speak about Mac mindfulness. Uh, because I think, you know, a lot of what I found when just like typing in mindfulness into like a search engine is basically training in self-optimization. So do that and you will become better at whatever. Better parenting, better teaching, better research, better drinking coffee. Um, and so I think there's a lot of you know, self-optimization referring to uh, mindfulness. And that's of course like streaming I, I, I. Um, and against that, it's interesting to actually read Heidegger's final take um, on um, the self in being in time, which is in paragraph 64. Um, because what Heidegger says there is basically there is no such thing as the self. And I think there's a lot of similarities between Heidegger's final take and Buddhist no self approaches. Uh, because what he says there, there's just not no such thing as self that Brown's care. Instead, it is care that enacts a self. So if there is such a thing, and that's not wrong to speak like that as a self, it is what we understand as self, quotation marks, in everyday understanding the natural attitude. And that's just a temporal stabilization of some understanding of what we might be in our comportment. So if the self in quotation mark is anything, it's process and a temporary stabilization within this process. Okay, then I want to say a few things about um, entschlossenheit and groundlessness. And I put this one like central quote um, in, in English and German um, on, on the slide. I don't want to read it out all, but, but I give you a moment to do it. And I think the main thing Heidegger is saying here is we need to understand that we can't ground what we're doing, at least not ultimately. So what we need to understand is we need to hold ourselves free, keep oneself free for the possibility of having to um, take back whatever we've um, believed so far. Based on, and that's not very well translated here, uh, based on when that turns out to be factically possible, uh, necessary. And one important thing I want to note about um, the term Entschlossenheit, so with this term, and that's why it's badly translated as resoluteness, Heidegger does the same thing as he does with like Entfernung, Gewissen and Schicksal. Um, namely, he takes a term that has a certain understanding in everyday language and uses it in a way where its meaning is turned into exact into the exact opposite. So it's like the, the best analogy is really with um, Entfernung, which means something being far away. But Heidegger like writes it with this little line between Ent and Fernung, and what it means then for in Heidegger's term is being close making things being close to oneself. So the term Entfernung, which in everyday language means distance or something being far away, for Heidegger means making things being close. And the same thing happens with Entschlossenheit, which gets like, which in everyday language means uh, like insisting on something. Um, and for Heidegger, it turns the meaning around and says like, like real Entschlossenheit is understanding that we cannot insist 
based on the insight into the groundlessness. So what do we understand or come to realize what becomes transparent to us in Entschlossenheit then? Um, I would say it's the insight that being itself is historical. And that means that in whatever way things reveal themselves to us, um, this way will always necessarily be selective. So the way in which entities reveal themselves to us excludes other possible ways of revealing. Seeing things, perceiving things one way excludes other possible ways of perceiving the seeing. And these ways of perceiving and revealing are historically variable. So our guiding understanding of entities has changed over time and we should expect future changes. And that implies that um, all ontologies, so all guiding understandings of being are finite in these two senses of selectivity and variability. And I would claim that the entire talk about finitude in being in time um, is about finitude of ontologies. And I think this is basically also, um, so this is generally what mindfulness reveals. And one important like my, like aspect that I can't go into, that there's also an interesting connection where we again could like relate um, Buddhist theory and practice um, to um, the practice of phenomenology in being and time, um, that there's an intrinsic relation between um, truth and self-transformation. Um, so, you know, um, so that for, for Heidegger, you know, it, it, it like the change of truth implies a transformation of oneself and vice versa. Now, um, and this relates to a question that Christos this morning um, asked uh, Mahuna O'Brien um, about, you know, is there a measure um, in Heidegger? And I would say, like, up until everything I've said so far, uh, I would claim that this is the continuity in Heidegger's thought. So there's no difference from like the first lecture courses to the very late works. But there's one interesting shift um, I would say between being in time and Heidegger's later works. And that is that in being in time, um, and this is like indicated already by the slogan of phenomenology to the things themselves, Heidegger still maintains that there is an epistemic measure. The thing, the things themselves. And there is at least a tacit implicit aim of getting it right like being faithful to the phenomena. And I would also say that like the way he um, conceives of um, Entschlossenheit as the, you know, um, keeping oneself free of taking it back follows this general aim of getting it right, being faithful to the phenomena. Um, while I think that in his later work, Heidegger like changed his mind on that point by now maintaining that at least on the highest level, so when it comes to these general modes of revealing, there is no epistemic measure. But please ask me about that. I have more to say, but I can't do it now because of time constraints. Um, and, and the only thing with then can, I mean, that, that would be a lot to say about uh, then letting be and, and Heidegger's understanding of the holy were like, there's, there's again a lot of interesting um, things to, to, to go into, which I can't now in this talk. So I wanna ask like one last question because it really troubled me while preparing this talk. Um, and that is uh, like the practice of mindfulness and also the practice of phenomenology. And I, I totally agree with the quote that I put now on the slide um, that it's interesting that like practices like Buddhist practices of mindfulness are extremely rich in like detailed descriptions of how one goes about it. 
like what one needs to do and how one needs to be aware of certain things while doing it. And by contrast, it's intriguing, like how little the phenomenological literature has to say about how to go about these like core um, practices of doing phenomenology. Like what does one actually do when doing the epoche or the reduction? Like what, what's the practice of that? And also in Heidegger, like there's very little in terms of like practical guidance of what, what does it mean to be gelassen? So I think there's, so, and that, but that also means like based on textual evidence from phenomenological text, we have little to say about that. I mean, several people asked uh, Mahoon this question this morning and there's really little to say. Um, but some, some interesting caveats um, in that context. So one thing that is interesting is like the um, emphasis on attunement in Heidegger. And with that, um, Heidegger's insistence that mindfulness is not achievable by an act of the will. And that, that's why he has like all these um, reflections on, on the will and the like way to go about not willing. Um, but then of course, this interesting question at least addressed towards being in time, um, this idea of wanting to have a conscious conscience, like, how, how, how does that um, fit into this, like re this theoretical reflection on the will? And wh what is like the practice of being prepared to not willing and letting things be in a non-willing way? Again, I can't go too much into that. Um, one last point I want to make is um, the strong emphasis that Heidegger puts on attunements actually not being something on the individual level, uh, but something on a much larger level. And he often claims on an epochal level. So really like attunements, basic attunements is are, are you know, that which constitutes epochs in the history of being. Um, and I, but I don't want to like say too much about Heidegger. Uh, I just want to come back to neoliberalism and like mindfulness in that context. Um, I just like give you that quote. Um, the neoliberal order has imposed itself by stealth in the past few decades, widening inequality in pursuit of corporate wealth. People are expected to adapt to what this model demands of them. Stress has been pathologized and privatized, and the burden of managing it outsourced to the individual. Hence, the battles of mindfulness step in to save the day. Anything that offers success in our unjust society without trying to change it is not revolutionary. It just helps people cope. However, it could also be making things worse. Instead of encouraging radical action, it says the cause of suffering are disproportionately inside us, not in the political and economic frameworks that shape how we live. And yet, mindfulness, sea loans, believe that paying closer attention to the present moment without passing judgment has the revolutionary power to transform the whole world. It's magical thinking on steroids. And there's also some, you know, some similarity in like uh, practitioners and uh, uh, theorists of, of mindfulness nowadays and many phenomenologists in this sometimes tacitly assumed and sometimes alleged apoliticality of the practice of mindfulness and the practice of phenomenology. And I'm very critical of that. Uh, I put like an example of that alleged tacitly assumed apoliticality of the practice, like both of phenomenology and mindfulness here on the slide. And in contrast to that, I wanna like emphasize that Heidegger is quite revolutionarily spirited. So his aim is not changing oneself or healing oneself. His aim is changing the world. Uh, but just like, let me say that um, revolutions aren't always good. I mean, you know, Heidegger's evolutionary spirit is one of the main factors that led him to support um, the Nazis. So, you know, you also need to be careful about like, what revolutions we want. Um, but 
like what we can say with Heidegger, um, you know, what Heidegger might understand with mindfulness is not therapeutical. It's not about knowledge. It is about transforming the world. And yeah, I put this last quotation so that, you know, there, there might also in this revolutionary aim, um, you know, a connection again between um, phenomenology and a certain understanding of mindfulness. Um, reducing suffering is a novel aim and it should be encouraged. But to do this effectively, teachers of mindfulness need to acknowledge that personal stress also has societal causes. By failing to address collective suffering and systematic change that might, be, that might remove it, they rob mindfulness of its real revolutionary potential, reducing it to something banal that keeps people focused on themselves. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gerhard. Can you hear me well? Or is there echo? No, there's no echo. It's, it's good. Okay. Let me know uh, if I should switch, like um, unmute, so mute maybe, myself. Maybe so you mute don't... yourself and un unmute yourself only if you need to respond. Very so good. We have, yeah, I will do so. We have about uh, 15 minutes of Q&A. Uh, uh, Ying Chen, uh, you want to come here for the Q&A? So questions can be addressed to either uh, of the two uh, speakers. Uh, and uh, we start with Mahon O'Brien, who has a question. Maybe just speak up a bit because they can't hear you. The microphone is here. Okay. Can, can you hear me? Sorry. Oh, he's muted. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, but, but please speak up. It's, it's very uh, soft, you but, but I can hear you. That would be great. Sorry. Okay, they're, they're going to make me come to the front. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so it, it's it's maybe related to a question I think that you thought that I was wondering about as well, uh, and it, it came up in a question from someone else in the the chat for my presentation, which is, uh, and I put the question: Well, what, what would thinking about mindfulness or uh, thinking about glass and height? Well, what what are the implications? What are the, what are the consequences? And, and you're asking, I think, a similar question and, and I agree with you I think in some respects Heidegger almost we want to say he doesn't really give us an answer but then in another way he, he does give us a very explicit answer he says we're asking the wrong question the question is not what can we do the question rather is how do we think so the, and this brings us to another problem maybe in Heidegger which I think is related to the very last quote that you put up there, uh, which I, I can't remember now, but you know, if if the revolution, and obviously this has implications for the, the political controversy in Heidegger as well, if the revolution is only going to be achieved through thinking with Heidegger in a particular way, then is it itself rather naive in some respects? In other words, you ignore economics, you ignore politics, you ignore everything in history except your own understanding of the history of the unfolding of being, which is related to the first part of the, the this thing I said to you, where he thinks all we have to do, I mean, insofar as we can do anything, doing is the wrong word. We should think. But I, I don't know if this is consistent with how you're, you're uh, reading. Just one other a, a little footnotes in, in brackets. In terms of the idea of a, a, a no self in, in being in time, I was curious about then what you make of the heavy emphasis on the Amenikite uh, and the notion of an authentic Dasein. And would the authentic Dasein not have, in some sense, an identity? In other words, the notion of a self, the worry is about a technical concern over terms like subject as opposed to identity. That's a, that's a theoretical question which you, you can ignore if, if you like. Um, yeah, thank, thank you very much. Um, yeah, Rick, uh, I, I answer mostly, I think, to your, your first question, because I think it's the more interesting one in the context of 
of the conference. Um, and yeah, I think there's a lot um, to it that, I mean, basically Heidegger's claim is that thinking is the, the real acting. Um, and I think there's a way of uh, making that claim comprehensible and meaningful also for such a revolutionary um, aim as I indicated in that, or, but, but for that to, to be plausible, um, I think we need to um, like emphasize that for, for Heidegger, it's not about um, the individual level. So my transformed understanding, um, but it's more about like this broad um, schemes of how things um, reveal themselves to us, which isn't so much about you know what um, we believe and what like maybe pro even propositional beliefs we hold, um, but more about like how things happen in our society. So build, building on your example, let, let me give an example. So before um, Apple um, introduced the iPhone, I mean, no one could even imagine how the world will look like with smartphones. And, and now, I mean, we can hardly like remember how the world was before smartphones. And, and I think this is like an example of how the technology like fundamentally shapes the way of how things reveal themselves to us. And, and when Heidegger speaks about thinking as acting, um, that's on this basic level of how things reveal themselves to us. And, and then it would mean like, um, you know, how, how, you know, how can such a, you know, revolutionary um, transformation take place as the introduction of the iPhone? Um, I think that that's, that's the level of thinking as acting. I think now we go to Francesca. Sorry, we're running out of time. Francesca? Yes. Hi, there. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Really enjoyed it. Uh, my question is related to, to the last uh, slide. Um, of course, mindfulness in the Adigarian perspective has anything to do with treatment or chemotherapies and something like that. But if we go through Zolicon seminars, we can find uh, some important sentences mm -hmm. such as meditative thinking, which should be the English translation for the Zinnung, mm -hmm. is uh, the starting point for every, uh, for every therapeutic practice. So my question is, if it's true that mindfulness conceived in terms of Buzinung has anything to do with a, a clinical ap application. However, did you find possible that we are entitled to use the meditative thinking as a, a different way of approaching to psychological and, a psych and particularly psychopathological condition? So we have to change our side, basically, not, not go and search into the brain what is going on into the relationship with people? Uh, short, short answer, yeah, I, I definitely think that we can uh, make this application. Uh, so if, it's just, uh, we, we need to be um, careful not to reduce it to that because mm -hmm. it has like a much broader aim. Thank you. Uh, Jim Morley. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Okay. My question is, firstly, uh, 
I think it's really important that you pointed out the MIC mindfulness problem and how uh, the movement does get co-opted. Uh, I think we also have to draw attention to the MIC phenomenology that goes on, what was so called picture book phenomenology, which is a lot of that going on in academia as well. So it, it seems that both movements get uh, usurped by, uh, by the culture and get dissipated. And that's, a, that's something we need to really watch out for. And I was glad you mentioned that. I also was very uh, impressed with your choice of Michelle People, the Michelle People quote. That's a very important point, that the Buddhists are the masters of pedagogy. They really teach the practice more than the philosophy. For them, the practicing comes first. The philosophy comes with the practice. We seem to have gotten it wrong. We just get students and we throw a book at them and say, read it, read Heidegger, come back and talk to me. And that doesn't work very well. And it's very hard to learn phenomenology. It's painfully difficult. And I think the movement would have taken off more if we did a better job of teaching it. Uh, Michelle, uh, Herbert Spiegelberg in the 50s tried to start workshops on practicing phenomenology, but it just didn't work because it went against the philosophical culture, the academic culture. People didn't want to do it, it's too practical. Um, but yet, I think that's where we are here. I think we do need to come up with practical workshop style approaches to doing phenomenology, as Maurice Nathanson actually encouraged us to do, to do it, to practice it. And there really is a thing called an epoche. And there really is a natural attitude. And there really is a beginner approach to this, to pick up. Of course, you don't stay with just the epoche and the natural attitude, but you move on from there. But I think you're really right. We need to get our act together about pedagogy. And I think you're right that there's a lot we can learn from how the Buddhists get pedagogy right. So I just want to see if you have a comment to that. Uh, I think my only comment is that I, that, that I couldn't agree more. And, right. and th thank you for pointing out also the, the Mac phenomenology. I think that's very important because especially how it, how it spreads to, to other disciplines, there's a lot of you know, talk that has phenomenology in the title and you know, things that are quite opposite to, to phenomenology inside. Yeah. <clears throat> we have a que two questions from Pierrick uh, Simon, uh, or Simon, I'm not sure how he pronounces his last name. Uh, the first one goes to Ying Chen. Uh, he says, uh, thank you both for those interesting talks. Uh, for Ying Chen, Yang, I agree with you that the non-judgmental part of mindfulness needs to be specified. Could you say more about why you chose the idea of self-criticism to specify it? Is there not other kinds of psychic pains that are not captured by the idea of self-criticism and perfectionism? Hey, okay, thanks for the question. So I think the in in a in a practice of mindfulness, so the non-judgmental means we shouldn't uh, evaluate, uh, we shouldn't evaluate or judge again. So evaluate again what, what the ideas coming to my mind. So I just let the idea uh, appear and, uh, and uh, accept it. So I don't do the second, second uh, uh, again, a second one of reflection to my, to my ideas. So I think this is uh, the, the non-judgmental in the, uh, practical convention means and uh, this it's um, but as i say there is still cognitive uh, dimension in the mindfulness but uh, so the non-judgmental so it because it is pro it is it's problematic because it is again bring us to a reflective reflective uh situation so in the mindfulness so we should count we should concentrate on one object. So my noetic, my noetic uh, structure of the intentionality is only to is only to one object. And I am in I am in the present. So I am immersed in this living experience. But the but in the practice, if I judgmental, so it is it leaves the living experience so to the reflective 
reflective uh, level or the reflective situation. So in this reflective situation, I uh, in my in my in my own personal opinion. So I think in this uh, in this in this situation of uh, reflection, so it is caused it is motivated from my other affection or other emotion minor minor traumatic experience from the past so that I away, again leave my presence and uh, to think about think about what in the in the in the past in my memory. So I think if we if 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 it is in a self criticism or in a in a self criticism so it is it is um it is in a strong sense of I so this this kind of reflection is in a strong sense of I so it is not uh it is very very strongly affected from the the past the past experience <laughs> yes I I think I I clear this. <clears throat> <clears throat> and uh, the other question, uh, maybe um, uh, Gerhard can see it, uh, is uh, from Pierrick addressed uh, to Gerhard. Pierrick says, to, to your question about the lack of methodological aids in phenomenology, could it be that you are asking about methodological aids that have strong gradualist assumptions where the mind has to go through steps and obstacles and gradually change itself? I mean, basically, my, my answer to the question would be um, the, the last but one question that I received. So, I mean, what I, what I was thinking about that, you know, when I got, you know, um, trained by phenomenologists, I mean, uh, I suppose basically what they did was they gave me books to read. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I mean, I have to confess, I cannot say that I'm much better at it or that, you know, as, as a teacher uh, of phenomenology now. So, I mean, that, that's a basic, basic, uh, basic observation that we are just not, not very good at explaining what it actually is that we are doing and teaching students um, on how to go about it. And I don't, so and I haven't thought about like what, what yeah, what, what it mean, would mean in terms of assumptions about you know the, the training process so to say um, I think we are like not not even there like most of us uh, and there is a question from um, from Joseph Cohen which uh, he, he sent it to me uh, I will read it out uh, Joseph if you could uh, copy and paste it uh, in the chat uh, in, uh, so that everyone can see it, but I'll start reading it out anyway. So Joseph says, uh, thank you for your lecture. My question refers primarily to your account of Gelassenheit in Heidegger. I understand what you're saying about the revolutionary aspects and in your response to Mahon O'Brien on thinking and acting, also on your very just typification of Heidegger's critique of the will and of will to power in Heidegger's Gelassenheit. But my question concerns the role of Kere in Gelassenheit, which seemed to be absent from your lecture. For Heidegger, I am wondering therefore if the Kere and its comprehension as emanating from the history of the truth of being, not the essential point of Gelassenheit. Furthermore, if this is true, and since the care is highly determined, I would like to ask you if the power concealed in the care, what Heidegger calls the saving power, not more powerful than the power of will to power. That is, is this saving power not resolutely excluding and foreclosing and according to which law more than what will to power excludes or forecloses? It, I think he also uh, posted it on uh, so that everyone can see the question. That that's 
Yeah, very good, but also an answer that, uh, a question that requires a, a really long answer, I'm afraid. So, so I mean, the, the one thing, uh, so as, as I said, like I'm a supporter of a continuity thesis in Heidegger. So I don't think that there's, you know, a strong care within Heidegger's thought, but, that, but that's not what you were referring to in your question. I mean, the question is um, about, you know, Heidegger's idea that in um, the history of being itself, um, there is, you know, besides the, you know, the increasing danger, this um, possibility of um, salvation. But then, of course, the, the interesting question is like, what, what does that exactly mean? Um, and like to give a rough idea of like my understanding of it in, in terms that are as much as possible, like not Heidegger imminent. So I think what, what he's basically saying is that um, with, um, you know, the, the emergence of um, the age of technology, maybe even more visible with the fourth industrial revolution, um, and maybe the fifth today than, than at Heidegger's terms, um, we basically came to an end of the understanding of being that has been guiding for our Western culture for you know, centuries, if not millennia. And being at that point of um, the end of that you know, epoch of history gives us the opportunity to, you know, see it in its um, historical variability and selectivity. And doing that might be the path to um, Gelassenheit or meditative thinking. And I think like one indicator uh, that that's actually what's taking place is like how widespread the acceptance of groundlessness is also in general culture. So, I mean, if you ask to like scientists, they, they fully accept the, the groundlessness of what they're doing. But I think it's also widespread in many um, general cultural trends. Um, but I mean, on the other hand, like nothing changes. I mean, it's just getting worse. So somehow this saving power seems not to be very strong, I'm afraid. Um, but one last remark, I think also like with this idea of kind of um, the Western thought coming to a closure and this emphasis and widespread cultural assumption of groundlessness, that's also what enables um, this dialogue with uh, Buddhist and other non-European practices. And I think um, if then this like trans cultural way of going about it might be the way forward. Um, but that should have been like a book length um, answer, I think that I now pressed into a few minutes. Uh, because uh, the next speaker, um, which is Javi Karel, I think she's not online yet. So uh, we can uh, take a couple more questions just for two more minutes. Um, I have a question to ask uh, to uh, Gerhard. Um, so if, um, if in being in time, if we read being in time as uh, having a, a sort of epistemic measure, which as you refer to would be the, going back to the things themselves. Uh, whereas with Gelassenheit later, we don't have a measure um, or any sort of say hierarchy, or is it there's no end point? Uh, would that mean that if we were to 
reconstruct or construct a notion of mindfulness in Heidegger, we would end up with having a different kind of mindfulness for being in time. Uh, it would entail something different than to, to having sort of mindfulness in the late Heidegger. And if yes, wouldn't that undermine a bit the continuity thesis? So that, that's an area where like my own interpretation hasn't, so where, where I'm not 100% sure about my own interpretation yet, but I, I can like tell you where, where I am at the moment. So I think it's important to emphasize that this, what, what you call relativism, um, only refers to um, like this highest levels of how things reveal themselves to us. Um, so, so I mean, as I, as I gave the example, so, you know, just the world transformed or changed so radically with the introduction of smartphones that just like a, a lot of things like changed in a way that we couldn't anticipate before. And, in, and on, on that, on that, I mean, I don't know if this is a good example now, uh, but also like in, in scientific paradigm shifts, you know, things change so drastically um, that, that I think on that, on that level, uh, there's, uh, there's a reasonable concept of relativism. Um, but, you know, as soon as we go a level more towards the concrete, um, you know, if we are within one way of how things reveal themselves to us, I mean, I think there it's reasonable to maintain um, that there are um, measures that, you know, allow us to differentiate between um, better and worse understandings of something. And, and that would also be my answer to, you know, the Heideggerians that refute scientific knowledge about viruses. I mean, you know, uh, viruses only re reveal themselves within certain medical knowledge. But then if we want to know something about viruses, I mean, we obviously have to listen to um, doctors and scientists because, you know, they are the ones that are capable of making viruses show themselves. And, you know, but I think they do, they, yeah. phenomenologically, they show themselves in other ways too, because you get sick and you don't need a microscope or anything to notice the effects phenomenologically and you die. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, but, 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 you know, everyone, but not everyone, of course, a lot of things are going on, uh, you know, below observational level, uh, but some things we can readily observe. No, but the thing is like, no, before, like, science revealed that there is such a thing as a virus and people had no idea why they got sick just as you know until very recently um, we had no idea like why um, wheat turns into beer because we didn't know that there's this species you know so so obviously like viruses only reveal themselves like we only know about you know the existence of viruses since we have certain scientific practices that allow those entities to show themselves. Like we have things like sickness, but that the cause of the sickness is a virus is something that required experimental setting um, that allowed viruses to appear in our world. Okay, uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Gerhard. Uh, we see Javi Karel has, uh, is with us now. Uh, so let's thank the speakers, uh, Gerhard Tonhauser and Yinchen Yang for their wonderful talks. And uh, hi, Javi. Uh, just a sec, we'll, uh, we'll make you into a co-host so that you can uh, unmute your microphone and so that you can uh, share your uh, PowerPoint if you have one. Great, thank you very much. Sorry.
for the delay. Okay, and we have a new chair. Hello, everyone. It's a little bit lower for me. Um, it's been down. Um, hello, welcome, Javi. It's uh, very good to have you with us. Uh, I'll just do a brief introduction. Uh, Javi is a professor at the University of Bristol. She, she has been uh, working primarily on uh, well-being, uh, looking in particular at uh, illness and the embodied experience of illness. Uh, and she's also been working closely with uh, doctors and the uh, Bristol Medical School. So she's actually uh, applying philosophy in a way that either we've forgotten to do or we no longer do too much. Uh, so it's, it's pretty incredible what she's 